So I'm a freshman at UC Berkeley. I'm studying electrical engineering and computer science. I've been programming in Scala for about the past eight or nine years. Um, and so today I'm going to be talking about Slinky. Slinky is a way to write React apps in Scala with Scala.js. So before I dive into what Slinky is, let's talk a little bit about why Slinky and why you need to even consider writing your web applications in Scala. And what is that flicker? OK. So why Slinky? So the way we write web apps has fundamentally changed recently. So your original model is you might have a Scala app. You might be using Play with Twirl for templates. So you have your database. You have your web application. And you're generating HTML. You send that to your client. And then you might have a little bit of JavaScript to make the experience a little more interactive. But what we've seen recently is we've moved the process of generating HTML and all of those views directly into the client. So now you're offering something like a REST API that your web client is going to talk to you. And you're not generating HTML on your server anymore. And now you're going to have a lot more JavaScript code that's going to be handling the user experience. And now the way you can implement this new web is use something like jQuery. So that's how we got started with doing it. So you load data from the server, check what's being rendered, apply the adjustments, you work with some user input to update your state, and then repeat. But the problem is this ends up looking something like this, where you forget to delete some HTML nodes from last time. That means you have a modal left there that's covering up the entire content of your application. It's not a great experience. And then the user is just stuck staring at a spinner while you freeze your application to wait for your server to come with a response. OK, that flicker is bothering me, so I'm going to try a different port. OK, so the real question is, what we're dealing with, the issue we're dealing with here is we have data and user input. Those are the two key components. We have data coming from a server. We have user input that the user is typing in locally. And we want to convert these into views. And so the answer to that that most developers use these days is React.js. So React.js is a framework for writing web applications um, in JavaScript created by Facebook. So it powers almost all Facebook products now. Um, and it's used by lots and lots of companies. Um, so with React, basically, you treat your application as a function from data, which is coming from your server, user input, and you're transforming it into views. And so in React, we call this data props and the user input state. So you have components that are going to be taking in props that's coming from somewhere else. You have state, which is contained locally, and you're turning that into something to display to the user. So let's take a look at a little bit of JavaScript code. So I know this is SF Scala, but we're going to take a little bit of a look at JavaScript code um, to see where we're coming from and how React is usually developed. So you write a class uh, that's going to extend React.component. You write a render function. The render function is going to return the HTML tree structure, which is what you're going to be displaying to the user. So in this case, we've specified that we're going to be taking the name value from the props. And then this is basically a form of string interpolation that you have um, in this format called JSX, which allows you to have these XML literals. So here, now if we want to render this, here, we're going to be rendering it to the DOM. That's our web uh, model. And so we're going to be constructing hello message. And then here, we pass in the name is Taylor. So then we would see on the screen a div with the contents hello Taylor. Now, in most applications, it's going to be a little more complicated than that. Because you're going to have your user putting in some input. And you want to update your view based on that. And you want to maybe send that data to the server. So that's when state comes in. So to, state, to add state in React, you have to first specify an initial state. So that's what you're starting out. So here, we're saying that the user input starts out empty. And now here in this application, we're going to be putting an input. So we say, OK, we are going to be putting a text box. The current value should be what's stored in the state. And this is one of the really interesting things with React, where you can make sure that your UIs are always consistent by keeping track of data like what the user has put in as part of your state. And so you know that whatever the user has typed in will always be stored in that state. And there's no way for that to go out of sync because you're controlling what's displayed in the text box with that local state. And that's what's happening when you're assigning that value attribute. Um, then we also have an on chain, so we pass in a function. This is just a regular callback to say, oh, we want to update the state whenever the user types in some new input. Now, you guys might be wondering, what does Scala have to do with this? Because there are lots of JavaScript developers. JavaScript developers are happy developing their web applications with React. Um, so where does, what does Scala have to do with this? So Scala.js is a project that compiles Scala code to JavaScript code. Um, it's used by a lot of applications, um, Alexi mentioned. Uh, my parents are working on an application that's an entirely Scala.js application on the front end. Um, and it's being used by a lot of people for a lot of different things. 
So what Scala.js lets you do is you can write Scala code like this, where you're printing hello, and it'll convert it into JavaScript that looks like this. And this is JavaScript that can be executed in the browser. It can be executed in environments like Node.js. It's even being used now if you want to use things like AWS Lambda, where you have a JavaScript runtime. And you don't want to spend a lot of time on JVM boot ups. You can instead compile your code to JavaScript and then run it there for fast boot ups. The important part here is Scala.js outputs regular JavaScript. This is not some special flavor of JavaScript where you're working within maybe a custom JavaScript implementation of a Scala VM or something like that. You're just outputting regular JavaScript. And that means it works perfectly with JavaScript libraries and JavaScript tools. And that's what really enables us to use React.js from Scala applications. Now, you might also be wondering, why not just use JavaScript? After all, React.js is .js. It's not React.scala. It was originally intended for JavaScript developers. And so why not just use JavaScript for all these applications? Now, the really important thing is all the features that Scala gives you. First of all, strong static typing. And that's if you are a Scala developer, you go into JavaScript, you're really going to miss that, that you don't have that strong static typing. And but even if you do use tools like TypeScript, you'll notice that you lose a lot of the conciseness. And Scala gives you the best of both worlds. With things like type inference, you can have strong static typing, but you don't lose the conciseness that you expect when you're working in languages like JavaScript. You get code reusability between your server and the client. So if you already are writing your backend application in Scala, that means you can share the exact same source code on the front end. Um, and this is a technique that's really popular. So libraries like cats and um, all, all, uh, maybe uh, upickle, which is the Howie's library for converting uh, Scala values into JSON. All these libraries cross-compile to both JVM and JavaScript. So that means everything that you expect on the server to be available is also available in JavaScript. Um, this also means, for example, let's say you have some complex algorithm that you might be running on the server as a batch job. But sometimes you also want to offload that work to the client so your server is doing less work. Here now, because you're using the same language for the front end and back end, and because you have the same Java and Scala APIs on both sides, that means you can just reuse the same code and then run that, that piece of code on the client. And Scala.js does a really great job of ensuring consistency. So that means if you have the same piece of code, you can expect it to be the same on JavaScript and JVM. You get lots of advanced language features. So macros, while they are complicated and can cause a lot of pain, if used properly, they're extremely powerful. And we'll see a little bit of that later. And lastly, an ecosystem of professional libraries and tooling. So you have things like Scala Test. As mentioned before, you have things like Cats or Circe. And you have all these libraries. They're extremely well developed. And you also have tooling like SBT. And they all work really well together. And by using Scala, you get to use all of these tools. And so that's Slinky. Slinky is a framework for writing React.js applications in Scala. So what does Slinky give you? Slinky lets you use React from Scala.js code. That's the core part of Slinky. That's its purpose. But it comes with a lot of additional features and design goals. So Slinky has a focus on making sure that all of the code you're writing, even if it's intended for React.js or writing React components, you can still easily use Scala libraries in this code. And also, it works with JavaScript libraries. So there's a lot of uh, software already been developed in the JavaScript community for React.js, so things like React Router, if you're routing between different pages in your web app. And so Slinky has a focus on making it super easy to use this existing libraries, even though they're written in JavaScript from your Scala code. And the last part is having a developer experience that's as great as JavaScript. So if you've developed an application with JavaScript, you'll know the experience is absolutely fantastic. You can save and edit in your editor. And by the time you switch back to your web page, it'll be automatically hot loaded. Everything will be updated. And so you have this extremely fast development cycle. And so Slinky has a focus on bringing that same developer experience over to writing Scala apps. So let's write some code. So now that I have internet, hopefully everything will go well. So OK, let's see if I can balance this. OK. So I'm going to, can you guys hear me? OK, awesome. So I'm going to go to, um, I'm going to create a new app. Um, so let's call this Scala SF demo. So this is the template. Um, this is all you need to get started with a brand new Slinky project. Oh, make it bigger. Um, See, I can just zoom in for now. Uh, most of the work we'll be doing is going to be with it. This is, huh? Yeah. 
So I'm just going to open this up in uh, VS Code um, anyway. So um, if we can bump that up. OK. So this gives us our starting project. So we have build a SBT. So Slinky apps are still built with SBT, except they do use um, Node um, and Package Manager to handle their dependencies. So if I go here, I'll start up SF demo. I can start up my dev server. So you just type in SBT dev. That sets up your entire hot reloading development server. Um, and so in a bit, we should see an app. But we can start going through the code already. So we have my src main Scala. So let's go to the main. So the main is your entry point into your application. So the goal, one of the goals of Slinky is to make writing applications in Scala just like it is in ES6. So the API mirrors what's in ES6 uh, very closely. So here, what we're doing is, OK, we're initializing hot reloading when we're in development mode. Um, we're getting, so this is just calling into the regular DOM APIs to create a development in our body. And then lastly, we're going to be rendering our app into that container. Um, and so app is where all the magic is happening. We import some CSS. We import an SVG logo. And then we have a component. So here we have a stateless component. Um, so because we're in Skull, we want everything to be nice and statically typed. So when you're defining components in Slinky, you define what are the props. So in this case, we're not taking any props. So that's just unit. Um, we specify that we need that the CSS for this part. And now here, we're just constructing. So you can't use XML literals because they're going away in future versions of Scala. So instead, we have this style of uh, constructing HTML trees, um, where you're just calling functions. And then you can specify like the class name. Uh, you can create an image. You can specify CSS. Um, and so if this is, OK, awesome. That booted up. So now I can go to localhost 8080, and that's our app. Um, so this is a React.js application running with uh, Scala.js in your browser. Um, now, we can look into this a little bit. We can inspect element. The React dev tools pop up. Um, so we are using React here. This is not a fancy animated GIF that I'm showing you guys. Um, so if I zoom in on this, we can actually see the structure for app. So we can see we have an app. It takes no props, no state. And then we can see we rendered all of this. Um, we can even do things like go to the source code. Um, uh, which didn't work this time for some reason. Um, but I can do things, for example, like let's say I throw an exception here. Um, because of hot reloading, it'll actually update. And we see that we have an exception. Um, but we, can, we should be able to jump to the source here. So we actually have full support for source maps here. So if you get an exception in your Scala code, you can actually jump uh, to the Scala source instead of to the JavaScript source. So you know exactly what's going on in your application. Um, what else can we do? So let's modify the app a little bit. So uh, we can say, welcome to React. And we can say, uh, SF Scala. And one of the cool things that you get with Slinky is you get uh, hot reloading. Oh, I should not crash my application on purpose. Um, but now we see we have hot loading. So without having to reload the page, I'm able to get live updates. And this even works with stateful applications. So it'll actually persist your state across different versions of your application. So then you can make things like changes to your styling without having to go through the whole process of navigating to, to, through your app to get to the place where you were testing before. All right, so that's a very quick uh, tour of what you can do. Now, one of the really core parts about Slinky is working with the ecosystem. So the, the core feature of Slinky that enables working with existing JavaScript libraries is the concept of external components, where you have Scala code that's interfacing out to existing JavaScript React libraries. So let's say you wanted to work with React Router. React Router is a really popular library where you can handle uh, different pages of your app rendering different components. And so if you wanted to use that library from Scala code, all you have to do is import React Router DOM. And then this at React object external component is where the actual magic happens. So at React, um, you pr probably notice also here, we have at React here. So this is a macro annotation. So this allows you to eliminate a lot of the boilerplate that's involved. It's not required for Slinky. If you don't want to use macros, you can just go ahead and use the uh, non-React API that's in the docs. Um, but this makes it a, very, a lot faster to get started with Slinky. So here we're specifying we have at React object route. So we're saying this is an external component. Now we want everything to be type safe. Even though the original library is written in JavaScript, that doesn't mean we can't have static types when we're interfacing with it. So here we're saying the props required for a route is what the path of that route is, what component we're rendering, 
and then whether or not we want to exactly match it, because React Router lets you fall through to other paths if um, e existing exact paths don't match. And then you specify, this is the component I want to use. And once you have that, then you can just simply use your component as route path is foo, component is my slinky component. And so with these few lines of code, you're able to use existing libraries and not have to reinvent your own router. And these external components are really powerful. So for example, with the router, no need to use that. R write it yourself. You can just use React Router. If you want to do a data layer, so if you're uh, getting into GraphQL, you can just use React Apollo. And actually, there's a library, um, Apollo GraphQL slash Apollo Scala.js. So Apollo, uh, the Apollo cl GraphQL client, actually has support for Scala.js. Um, and so you can write code that looks like if it loads. So you can write code that looks like this to say, I want to run a GraphQL query that's going to get my rates. And then with the results, I want to render some elements to my screen. So if you want to get started with GraphQL and you want to write your web app in Scala, it's very easy to get started with that. Um, you can also, if you want to, uh, if you want to style your components and you don't want to just use CSS files, you can use styled components. It's a very popular library. Uh, you can check out Slinky styled components for an in, uh, interface already implemented to use styled components. And if you want to create a super fancy app where you're rendering 3D objects animated across your screen in, at 60 frames per second, there's actually a library called React 3 Render, which allows you to use React to render 3D uh, models inside your application. And you can use that from uh, Scala.js code. Now, another part of what I talked about working with this ecosystem is also working with the ecosystem's build tools. So Webpack is a really popular bundler that allows you to take all your JavaScript uh, dependencies, put them together into a single bundle that you can ship to your users. And so through the Scala.js bundler SBT plugin, we're actually able to have SBT talk to Webpack. Um, and so we're able to manage all of these different build tools that we need for a web application under one single uh, build file. Now, another cool thing you can do with uh, Slinky uh, is if you already have developers who are using JavaScript in, uh, in your company, but you want them to start exploring using Scala.js, Slinky supports reverse interop. So that means you can export Slinky components written in Scala to JavaScript land, and you can have JavaScript developers use your Scala implemented components just like they were any regular components. So you can check out Slinky reverse interop demo. Um, for the interest of time, I want to be able to go through that. Now, another awesome thing you can do at Slinky is go beyond the web. So if you have this React model, normally you're outputting HTML. That's what React started out with. You're developing web apps. But this model can be extended to views in general. And so you have the ability to create native apps with Scala through Slinky. So here we're using React Native. So I have my application on the right. Um, if this is, is this playing, OK. Um, so this is actually a natively rendered um, application. So, there are, so unlike um, other um, libraries that existed for JavaScript development on native where you would just style um, a web view to look like a native app, these are actually native components being rendered by the iOS runtime. Um, but the application itself was written in Scala. So the Scala code is compiled into JavaScript. JavaScript is loaded by your application. And you're, so you're able to create native applications using Scala now. Um, so again, I won't be able to go to, through this um, for the interest of time, um, but you can check out, and there's a template for you to get started, SBT new, should odd slash create React Native Scala app, um, and you just hit SBT fast opt JS, and you'll have a native app running in no time. So in conclusion, what does Slinky give you? It lets you use React from Scala.js code, Let's use this with Scala libraries and tools. So if you're using things like Circe, if um, you want to write your own custom uh, logic to handle talking to your REST backend, you can do that all with exi the existing knowledge you have in Scala. You can also use JavaScript libraries and tools. So you can use existing JavaScript packages. If you have some custom steps to import SVGs and optimize them, you can use Webpack plugins, for example, for that to uh, integrate those into your build pipeline. And then you have a developer experience that's as great as JavaScript through things like hot reloading um, and these build tools that all work together. So it's super easy to get started. Check out the docs at slinky.chargers.me. Um, you can check out the repo. And we also have a pretty active um, community chat channel on Gitter. Um, but to get started, um, if you want to just get started with the code, you can just do sbt new shadow slash create react scala app. So that's Slinky. Um, Slinky is 
used in production. Um, it is being used by Oracle for some of their um, internal apps, as Grant mentioned. It's also being used on LearnRugga.com, which actually launched today. That's my, the uh, product my parents have been working on. Um, and that is a full um, React.js Slinky application that's running in production today. And now, a surprise. Um, so this is a surprise even for my parents. Um, so um, if you've been watching the news with React, you might have heard about this new concept called React Hooks. Um, and so Slink one of Slinky's primary goals is to make it possible to write React applications in Scala just like you do in ES6. And that includes brand new React features. So this feature of React hasn't even been um, released yet. It's still in an alpha version. Um, but today, um, I'm excited to show you a preview of support for React.js hooks in Slinky. So I'm going to open up Slinky hooks. Um, so this is the project where we have an implementation. So let's say we have my, an application. I have my main file where I'm going to be rendering my app body. In this case, I just have a regular app body. So I'm just rendering a diff tree. This is the same demo that we just saw. So in this case, I know that I don't depend on any data. So I'm just storing this in a val because I don't need a component in order to be able to render this. So if we see, oh, I already have the server running. So I'll kill that. And then I'll boot this up again. Um, so if we render this, we'll just get that basic demo that we saw before with the React logo spinning and then the Hello World message. Now, one of the really cool things that you can do with React um, in recent versions is this concept of functional components. So what we saw before when we were defining components is we had a class that extends component. We defined a render method. But with new versions of React, you can define components just by implementing a function that takes your props and returns that React tree. And this makes it very easy to eliminate a lot of the boilerplate involved. So if it's booted up right now, OK, awesome. So this is the app that we have right now. So first, let's write a component that's going to be rendering this instead of just having this be a static app body. So I can do val component. Um, and here, I'm going to import slinky.hooks.underscore, which contains the logic in order to implement this. So I'm going to do functional component. I have to create my props. So I'm going to create a case class. So here, we're going to pass in a name to say hello to in our application. So name is going to be a string. I'm going to define a functional component that takes this props. And then here now, we just pass in a function that's going to go from props and return the React tree that we want to render. So one of the really cool things is this is just a function. So that means we can implement this as a partial function. So we can do a pattern match here. So we can say props name. And now we're going to render this tree that we had. So I can cut this out. And I can render this. And here, I'll use a little bit of string interpolation to say, welcome to React name. And my SBT server has been running in the background. OK, so now my app body is gone. So now if I actually want to use this component, I can go to my main. I can do app.component, and I just have to pass in the props. So I do app.props name equals SF Scala. And if I save this, we should see it hot reload. Welcome to React SF Scala. Now here, this is just functional components. This is something that has existed in React. It's used in production. The really cool thing is React hooks. So one thing you'll notice here is because this is just a function, um, there's no way to actually and originally keep track of states here. Because um, here, we're just going from props to a tree. So where would we say, oh, I want to update my state? There's no API to call that, because we don't have an instance of some object here anymore like what we had when we were defining classes. So React hooks are a proposed API that Facebook announced a couple of weeks back, in fact. And this allows you to use concepts like state within functional components. And it makes it really easy to write applications with a lot less code. So if I want to do state, I'm going to do what is my current value of state, and I'm going to update state. And, this is, and the, what I assign this to is use state. Now use state is saying, OK, this functional component is going to be having some state that it's going to be keeping track of. The parameter that I pass in is going to be my default value. So here I'm going to have a button, and we're going to count how many times we've pressed the button. So I say my default value is 0. Now state will always be the current value of the state I'm tracking. And update state is a function that takes a new value of the state. So this is where React hooks comes in. So use state is a hook. Now I can add a button. 
um, where on click, we're going to, um, we'll do something. We'll implement that later. Uh, click me. And then we can also add a p tag that says um, the button has been clicked, state times. And this is string interpolation. So if we go back to my app, uh, once it hot reloads, oh, not found use state. Oh, yeah, you have to do hooks. I implemented this at like 2 AM last night. So um, even this API is a little new to me. So we have a button. It doesn't do anything because we're not doing anything on the click. But we see that we have some state here. Now, if we want to actually update it, it's very straightforward. Here, now all we have to do is call update state. We take our state and add one. And that's it. So now you have a stateful application that's keeping track of your buttons. And this eliminates a lot of the original boilerplate involved with having to define a state type, defining an initial state method. Um, and if you look at some of the tweets around this when it was announced, uh, some people have done some uh, uh, analysis around how it changes the structure of your React components. And it really helps to break apart where you're working with state, where you're working with your actual views. Um, and this is a really awesome change. So now you can click your button, and it updates your state. And if we inspect element, go to React, we see that we actually have a component. Um, right now, it's unknown. That's because um, we can't detect the name yet. That's something I'm working on. But we can see here that we're actually keeping track of the state. Um, and this is all React hooks in action. Um, so as of today, Slinky is the first and only Scala React.js library that has support for React hooks. Um, this is an alpha feature for the next version of React, but Slinky is already ready in action to handle that. Um, so this is going to be open source. As soon as I get home and I have a stable internet connection, I will publish it to GitHub. Um, so try it out. Um, see what you can do with it. Um, and I can answer any questions now. OK, yeah. So the question is that in this template that we had, um, we are rendering the React logo as instance of a string. So in Scala.js, when you're emitting these requires, so it, in JavaScript, when you're dealing with modules, um, you create these require statements to say, oh, I need to import this file. So when you're working with things like SVGs, you can import them as um, just a file, and then you'll get back a string which contains the SVG object. Um, and so in Scala, in Scala.js, the way you do that is you have to create an object, and then you annotate it with add JS import. So the reason we have to cast it to a string is here we have an object. This can't extend string, um, because string is a final class. Um, and so what we do is we say, this is just a JS object for now. Don't worry about the typing, and then we'll cast it later, because we do know that we're going to be returned a string when we try to import this SVG file. <laughs> Yeah, um, so it's learnraga.com. Um, so this is all a Slinky application. Um, it, it's basically a, a website to learn Indian classical music. So you can write compositions. You have this interactive editor. This is all by, in Slinky React.js. You can even do things like playback. So I can play music. I, I don't know if it's loud enough. Um, but this entire application is built with React. Um, and um, it's pretty awesome, and it's ready for you to try out today. Um, so proof that it's using React. Yeah, this is all one giant Scala.js React application. So try it out. It's live today. Uh, it was actually just launched earlier today. So um, try it out. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Are your parents here tonight? They're right there in the back. <laughs> All right, um, so if there are no more questions, um, I'll be hanging around. Um, also, I am a freshman in college, so if you're looking for interns, um, I'd love to chat um, for next summer, so, uh, but thank you.